Good evening, everyone. My name is Ross Emmett. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at ASU. And I'd like to welcome all of you to um, the, another lecture in the Perspectives on Economic Liberty series that we uh, host every year um, here at, at ASU. The Perspectives Lecture Series emerges from the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty's mission, which is to evaluate the contribution of economic liberty to human betterment. One of the ways to pursue that mission is to invite, obviously, a variety of guests who will in interrogate, interrogate our center's topic, evaluating its role in human betterment for good or ill, revisiting the history of the debate over economic liberty, and also considering its relation to other values and freedoms that we may possess. Today's lecture focuses on the, way, the ways in which market interactions can improve the lives of black Americans. Paternalistic policies of the past have left, the, have left a legacy of violated rights, broken contracts, and a, and a, and a record of injustice. Thinking especially about economic liberty, we can say that black Americans have faced obstacles that most other Americans have not. But at the same time today, entrepreneurship among black Americans is overcoming obstacles, creating opportunities, and aiding the emergence of flourishing institutions and new cultural forms. Our speaker, Rachel Ferguson, is co-author of a book entitled Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, Hope, Heartbreak and the Promise of America, which was published two years ago. She currently serves as director of the Free Enterprise Center, which is essentially the equivalent of our center here at Concordia University, Chicago, as well as the assistant dean of the school there, the business school there. And she is a professor of business ethics. So please welcome um, Rachel Ferguson. Okay, how does that sound? Good. Sound all right? Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, I'm excited to talk to you on uh, Black History Month. This is very fitting. And so um, I'll just start by saying kind of what motivated the project. I co-wrote this book with a historian, Marcus Witcher. I'm actually trained as a philosopher um, and have always done political philosophy and economic philosophy. So of course, if I was going to write a book like this, it needed to be, is, is it too high? Sorry, is that okay? Oh, okay, they'll fix whatever's happening. Um, so of course, you can't write a book like this without a historian. So I was very, very happy to come together with Marcus Witcher. And you know, as a political philosopher in the classical liberal tradition, which I'll explain in a minute, um, I have actually always had sort of the plight of black Americans in the back of my mind. And that had to do somewhat with the way I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, with foster brothers and uh, dealing with the criminal justice system and various things in my experiences. But um, I also lived basically 10 minutes on one side of Ferguson, Missouri, and worked 10 minutes on the other side of Ferguson, Missouri. So I was passing Ferguson all the time and very familiar part of town. And uh, Ferguson is actually a very charming place. It's got a beautiful main street, uh, wonderful restaurants, and, and always have been um, a nice area in North County, which uh, the areas around it struggle a little more uh, than Ferguson. So that's a little myth busting there for you from what you might have gotten from the news. But um, after that occurred, you know, I was at the Liberty and Ethics Center at Lindenwood University, and I had an opportunity. I had an opportunity to have some panels on criminal justice reform. Uh, I had an opportunity to support the entrepreneurs in the area. Uh, people were scared away from the businesses, I think un unnecessarily. And so uh, as I became involved in these things, um, I kind of became known on campus for being interested in these issues. And so when a, uh, a group of students, the Black Student Union, wanted to go to the Smithsonian, uh, the opening actually, the grand opening of the Smithsonian on uh, African American culture and history, uh, my colleague, Patrick, who's in the acknowledgments, came to me and said, hey, can you help me do this? Uh, I said, absolutely. Can I talk to your class about um, kind of a different take on some of the systemic oppression that African Americans have experienced? Um, it's a different way of explaining it. It's maybe highlighting different elements. It has to do with 
economic exclusion or exclusion specifically from the institutions that undergird economic growth, private property, freedom of contract, and equal protection of the rule of law. And he said, sure. <laughs> so I uh, came up with these uh, lectures, which were really drawn from 20 years in what I suppose you could call the liberty movement. And what does that mean? Well, when I talk about uh, classical liberalism, of course, I don't mean liberalism in the American sense, right? So Americans tend to use the word liberal to mean something like center left, um, which is a little bit odd. It's not the way that liberal is used in philosophy. And it's not the way that it's used internationally as well. And so in philosophy, when we say liberal, we're talking about the root word liber, meaning free, right? It's the same root as liberty. And the focus is that, hey, in the modern world, we're, we're global, we're in pluralistic societies. And so it's one thing to have a politics that's built around a shared vision of the good. You can imagine something like that in Athens, maybe, right? With 100,000 people that all have the same religion and speak the same language. But what do we do now, right? We're in the modern world, we're traveling all over, we're moving, we're mixing. And so we really need um, a government structure that is focused on the freedom of the individual so that individuals can come together into communities and pursue their vision of the good because frankly, we don't agree, right? We don't necessarily agree on what the good human life is. And so uh, we focus more on individual freedom as the goal of what the state is trying to support. Classical liberalism is also very enthusiastic about free markets. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we actually are living in the best time in history. Did, did everybody know that? Did you know you're living in the best time in history? <laughs> uh, depending on how you measure it. But truly, we are down to, if you think about something like abject poverty, for instance, which is living on you know, three, the equivalent of $3 a day. Uh, 200 years ago, everyone basically, right? The, the vast majority of people were in abject poverty. Just 40 or 50 years ago, we were still at 40% abject poverty, we are at 8%. 8% of the global population, and yet the global population is 8 billion people. Wow, right? That should sort of strike us and make us curious, what have we been doing for the last 200 years that's allowed that to happen, right? It's kind of a miracle. It, and it's, it's one we don't talk about enough, uh, because there's actually a lot of studies out there, and I, I uh, encourage you to go to gapminder.org to see this. On gapminder.org, you can take a little quiz, and it'll show you not only that you probably have some misconceptions about how good things are, way more people have clean water and electricity and access to education and many of the things that we take for granted, way more people have them today than you might realize. Uh, but it also shows you how many people don't know that, right? So it's actually quite common to be very confused about that. So what the classical liberal philosophers are saying is, if you honor individual freedom, if you honor the individual right to private property, if you allow people to make deals with one another and you don't get in the middle of it, if you allow free trade across borders, you will see this incredible flourishing. And in fact, we have. We have seen that. And so if you'll talk to maybe some of your international friends and you say the liberal party, they actually mean the free market party, the free trade party. That's what they're referring to. So it can be a little confusing for people from out of the country to arrive here and hear the way that we use the word classical liberal. But in 20 years in the liberty movement, I had actually come across a lot of really interesting insights on race and discrimination. We actually have a... a Gary Becker is a famous economist who won a Nobel Prize for some of these insights. Um, you know, uh, uh, Milton Friedman and his discussions of the minimum wage. You know, there were so many things that I was aware of and I thought, you know, in all this discussion around, uh, uh, around race and systemic oppression, nobody's thinking to themselves, you know who we should ask? The classical liberals. <laughs> What do they have to say on race and discrimination? And partially that's their fault, right? It's partially the fault of that movement. You might have heard of the libertarians who are sort of like the grandchildren of the classical liberals. It's partially the thought of the, the fault of that movement that they haven't necessarily marketed the way in which uh, classical liberalism has 
has supported and defended minorities when they have been oppressed. But in fact, there's quite an impressive tradition of that. This is something I really discovered as I worked on my research. I didn't even know, for instance, that William Lloyd Garrison and his whole group, Harriet Beecher Stowe, eventually Frederick Douglass, right, joined that group, and others, were all, uh, they were abolitionists, we knew that, they're famous for that, but they were all free marketeers, very extreme free marketeers. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison wanted to get rid of every, uh, he, you know, tariff house, right? <laughs> he wanted to get rid of them all over the world. You know, he just wanted to snap his fingers and have them disappear. He wanted total free trade. And what I didn't realize is there was this whole movement over in England, right, with Richard Cobden and John Bright. And if you don't know about this, don't worry, but there was this big debate over the Corn Laws. And the same people who were arguing for free trade were arguing for abolition of slavery. Why? Because what they were saying is, you can't control people. That's not right. It's not right. And what's worse is when you use violence. That is totally unacceptable. You cannot use violence to interfere with people if they're not hurting anyone. And so no, you can't own slaves, and nor can you interfere with people's trade. And to them, it was the same sort of nonviolent philosophy. Okay? And so eventually, Frederick Douglass joins this group, except uh, he disagreed with Garrison on something. So Garrison, um, you know, was worried about the Constitution because after all, it was a compromise with slavers, right? Compromise with the South. But uh, Frederick Douglass was actually influenced by another libertarian thinker, Lysander Spooner, who said, you know, you should read the, the Constitution like a contract, you should hold it to its word. And, and Douglass said, um, actually, the Constitution, the document, is a great liberty document. The problem has never been the Constitution. The problem has been Americans' willingness, their courage, right? Whether they had honor enough to live up to their Constitution. So Douglas actually split with Garrison over this point. And he began to start to argue that the American project is actually a liberty project and that the history of slavery was something foreign that it had inherited and frankly, that could have doomed it forever, but that what we should do is reject that part and keep the Liberty Project, keep that going. Douglas was a huge free marketeer. He actually went on tour with John Bright all through Europe, and he became an honorary Irishman. Did you guys know this? <laughs> so great. Douglas is the best. <laughs> such a great writer, such a great speaker. He became an honorary Irishman. They called him the Black O'Connell because his arguments for free trade would mean cheap food for the poor. And they were starving, right? They needed cheap food. You needed to be able to trade across borders, okay? As opposed to what was popular at the time, we would call mercantilism, right? Or now we would say protectionism. Let's pr protect domestic industry and, and limit free trade. He was arguing against that. Douglas was quite clear about this. Um, he was, had a brilliant way of putting things, too. So in the movement, there were a lot of free marketeers, the abolitionist movement, but of course there were socialists and anarchists and all kinds of people in the movement. And he would argue with the socialists in the movement. And he would say, your issue is, this is so funny, he would say, it's not so much villainy as honest stupidity that you think that any piece of bread that you put into your own mouth has to be taken out of the mouth of another. What is he saying? He's saying the problem with your socialism is that you think the economy is a zero-sum game, right? That if I win, you have to lose. But that's not true. A market economy is a positive-sum game. It's a win-win game. Why? Because if we specialize our labor, I do the thing I'm good at, you do the thing you're good at, and we trade, we're both better off. We've created more wealth. Heck, we might be making other people better off too, right? Maybe we just invented something new, something more efficient, something higher quality, something cheaper. Douglas understood all of this. He understood it very clearly. He's a great hero of liberty. But as you move on, you see more of this. So for instance, two of the, of the major players in the founding of the NAACP were serious classical liberals. 
who were thinking to themselves, hey, we've got laws here, we've got a constitution, we could appeal to that to fight for black liberty. They were white men, but they were classical liberals fighting for black liberty on the basis of the American Constitution. You see the same thing with somebody like Rose Wilder Lane at the Pittsburgh Courier, the greatest black newspaper in the United States of America at the time under the wonderful editor George Shiler, who's referred to as the black H.L. Mencken. All right, Shiler was an anti-communist. He was an anti-New Dealer. He started something called the Double V Campaign in the 40s, fighting fascism, victory over fascism abroad and Jim Crow at home. Right? And Rose Wilder Lane joined this newspaper and she thought, I'm home. These are my people. They get it. Because for her, if you guys don't know who Rose Wilder Lane is, do you know who Laura Ingalls Wilder is? Little House on the Prairie? Yeah. She probably helped her mom write those books. <laughs> she was a very good writer. Very good writer. And uh, Rose Wilder Lane actually had started out as a communist. She was thinking of joining the party, but she took a trip to the USSR, and let's just say that when she came back, she was no longer a communist. Uh, <laughs> we can put it that way. Uh, but she became very passionate about the idea of individual liberty. And so at the Pittsburgh Courier, she began to discover, she said, wait a second, as a white person, I don't think I, you know, I was treating something like lynching almost like they were just one-off events. And now that I'm here and I'm actually a part of this community, I'm realizing that these are not one-off events. This is a campaign of domestic terrorism. And she's like, please forgive us, we didn't know. <laughs> you know, a lot of, of Northerners, for instance, just didn't get it. So she would write passionately in the pages of the Pittsburgh Courier to make people aware of this. And she would also argue against things like the use, the, the racist uses of zoning and things like that. It's all about property rights, right? Yeah, you can make it look like you're not being racist because you're saying, well, we just don't want high density housing. Okay, well, that means more affordable housing, right? Uh, that's what it means. And so it's going to have racist effects and is often done for that reason. She was very passionate uh, and, and convincing and Rose Wilder Lane is, is referred to now today as one of the three mothers of libertarianism, if you didn't know that. She's famous for that, wrote a great book called The Discovery of Freedom, fighting for black rights from a classical liberal perspective. Zora Neale Hurston, the great black novelist and anthropologist, anti-New Dealer. She wasn't excited about the New Deal because what she saw was a very paternalistic state coming in to kind of treat you like a child. And it's interesting, Zora Neale Hurston grew up in a freedman's town. She grew up in one of these towns where everyone was black. Her dad was the mayor. And so in her mind, black people could do anything, right? I'm sure that was part of her psychology from how she grew up. And so she was sort of insulted by this idea that uh, we would need to be rescued, black people or anyone else, right? And, and Zora Neale Hurston is an, an amazing out-of-the-box thinker, but she got blackballed by Langston Hughes out of the Harlem Renaissance because she, he was a communist and she was an individualist. You know, they, they disagreed. And you see this continuing, this sort of um, uh, classical liberal instinct to step in when minority groups are being oppressed. You saw it with the Japanese internment camps. You saw it with Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, uh, you saw it with the um, pr protest against the drug war. You saw it with the emphasis on mass incarceration, the mass incarceration crisis, right? So much overlap between the concerns of minority communities and classical liberal principles. I thought, wait a second, this should be a book, <laughs> right? This should be a book. Somebody needs to put this together. And so that's what Marcus and I did. So let me just give you a little walk through uh, the book. I'm drinking a lot because I'm from the Midwest. So it's very, I mean, my lips are already chapping. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> so forgive me if I'm taking a lot of drinks. Um, so we really start out by talking about general classical liberal principles. And I even have little breakout bits in the book called Lessons in Classical Liberalism, where I might tell you about the great enrichment, right? Or I might talk about the way prices work, the miracle of the price system and how we can all adjust things uh, through prices and, and allocate resources efficiently. So you'll be learning a little bit about classical liberalism as you go. 
But we also talk about this strange sort of intense political tribalism that we're experiencing right now. Isn't it strange? I don't know how strange it feels for different generations, but I grew up in the 90s. Uh, and before the, um, before the trial, you know, <laughs> of Bill Clinton, before the impeachment of Bill Clinton, boy, it was kind of a peaceful time. You know, I mean, the people were sort of getting along and doing things together. I don't remember thinking about politics when I was 16 or 17 years old. I wasn't thinking about that. Um, but man, the kids are nowadays, aren't they? I mean, wow, things have really changed. The tenor in the country has really changed, and you feel this intense polarization and tribalism. And I thought, you know, when it comes to these racial issues that really did blow up after, uh, after the events in Ferguson, we kind of have a false dichotomy. That's what I'm arguing in the book. We have a false dichotomy. And the false dichotomy is, if you're pro-black, if you're someone who cares about the history of the black struggle in America, you'll be big government. That's the assumption. If you're a small government person, you must not care. Right? It's not important to you. And yet, when you go back through the history, not only do you find all these small government people fighting for black rights, but you also find huge federal programs gone terribly wrong. Right? The Federal Housing Administration, the federal highway system, urban renewal, the perverse incentives of the welfare state. I mean, I could just keep going. And you think, wait a second. Why do we think that the best thing for an oppressed minority is going to be big government when big government has so often been the offender? right? The very entity doing the oppression. So I just wanted to sort of try a different way. right? What if you could be small government and pro-black? And that's what we wanted to suggest. So as you start thinking through it, this was very um, hubristic of us. But we decided to just go ahead and do like all of American history, <laughs> which was way too much. So it's a very fast gloss, although it, it is readable, right? We, kinda, we move at a pretty quick pace. But of course, we have to talk about slavery. You can't just skip over it, right? And so I thought, look what's going on with our discussion of slavery right now. This is actually hugely important because it's such a popular idea. You've got this group called the New Historians of Capitalism. Now, if you've heard of the 1619 Project at the New York Times, um, there's lots of great essays in the 1619 Project, but there's a couple of questionable essays. So I think the war over that has been a little exaggerated. There's a couple of essays that people have taken issue with, and then they haven't really taken issue with the others. Uh, but I took a big issue with one of them, but the one by Matthew Desmond. And what I said was, in, in this essay, Matthew Desmond tries to say, well, you know, you know, the way that corporations act is really something that they've gotten from, uh, from the plantation. I thought, well, first of all, that is a weird thing to say. Plantation owners didn't see themselves as capitalists at all. They saw themselves as aristocratic feudal lords. You know, they had a very medieval kind of concept of themselves. Um, they weren't super focused on efficiency the way you would think of, you know, a, an industrialist being. Um, I don't mean they never did anything efficient, but you kind of did what you had to to keep up that lifestyle. But they weren't, you know, they weren't building a lot of infrastructure in the South. But also, setting all those cultural things aside, there's a basic economic mistake being made here to associate capitalism with slavery. I know, I know that they occurred at the same time, right? So it can be confusing. But I went all the way back to Adam Smith, uh, the, the, the writer of The Wealth of Nations, right? The father of economics, arguing for free trade in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations. And he's always, always anti-slavery, consistently anti-slavery. John Stuart Mill, consistently anti-slavery. Why? Because for two reasons. One, of course, is moral. It's actually on his grave. I've been to Scotland. I went to Scotland for my honeymoon. You can guess why I'm named Ferguson, right? My, husband, <laughs> my husband's of Scottish <laughs> extraction. So we went to Scotland, and we actually visited Adam Smith's grave. And there on his grave are the words, something out, if I get the quote quite right. It's something like, 
uh, the property that one has in one's labor is the most sacred, as it is the source of all property. Right? All property rights starts with the fact that I own myself. And it's up to me who I work for right? and what I accept in return for the work that I do. And so, so one is moral, but his other argument is economic. right? His other argument is saying, wait a second. I'm arguing through this whole book that we should specialize our labor and trade in order for things to be efficient. And who knows how best to use one's labor? One side. <laughs> you know, that's called local knowledge. You're the one who knows. Who is going to be incentivized to improve your human capital, get you education, get you training, get you experience? You. Who's going to put you in the place where your labor is most needed because you're, it's, it's, it's uh, drawing the greatest wage? You. You're going to go, hey, you know what? If we move over here, I can make more money. We can get a cheaper house. We got more room for the kids. It's called incentives, right? This is simple stuff. It's econ 101, guys, right? Not difficult. So what happens when you create a system in which one group of people are not allowed to improve their human capital, not even allowed to read, besides other forms of learning, not in every case, but in many, most, vast majority of cases, right? They're not allowed to move to where their labor is most needed. They're not allowed to invent things and trade and own their own property. What's going to happen? You're going to lose out on everything that that group had to offer. So here's what's confusing about it. And this is why people get it twisted, I think. It's because some people get rich. A small group of people got rich. The plantation owners, guys, it was like a small group of families. This was not a huge number of people. Most whites in the South were very poor, much poorer than poor whites in the North because they didn't have industrial jobs to go to. And they were bidding their wages against free labor, the, the labor of slaves. Okay, And so it actually hurt the vast majority of people in the South. It was a very inefficient form of labor. You're not looking for machines and things to do things more efficiently because you have people. And you saw this after emancipation, by the way. It was crazy. After emancipation, you had something called, uh, Douglas Blackman called it slavery by another name. It's called convict leasing, the convict leasing program. And in this program, uh, well, there were a lot of, frankly, trumped up crimes, things like standing there not being able to prove you were employed, uh, or you know, having a gun, which of course everyone had at that time. Um, and, and so black men would be criminalized then you'd have sort of a show trial where you would charge the black man for the representation of the townsperson, who was his lawyer, I guess. And that way, he would serve both the sentence you gave him for the trumped up crime and the debt that he owed the court. It was a totally corrupt system, utterly, utterly corrupt from the perspective of individual rights. These were not even real crimes, 95% of the time or they were overplayed, a, a, a misdemeanor turned into a felony, that kind of thing, OK? And so this went on. But what were these men often doing? It was ridiculous. They were down in mines, handing pails of water from hand to hand. Guys, this is 100 years after the invention of the steam engine. This is not an efficient way to do things. But it's a way you'll do things if you have the labor available to you, right? Now, could these men have been out in the world doing wonderful things for the economy and making everyone else richer if they weren't handing pails down a line hand to hand? Yes, they could have. Yes, they could have. And that's exactly what goes on in slavery. So that's my point, is there's a reason that all the classical liberal economists are anti-slavery, both morally and economically. It doesn't make sense. And so you go on to see that every, there's a really interesting um, work being done by this guy named Nunn. He goes around and looks at all the places in the world where there was a slave harbor. And it turns out that every place where there's a slave harbor is today poorer than similar places around it that did not have a slave harbor. It undermines the spirit of innovation. And if we learn anything from the great enrichment, my friends, 
It's that the key to growth is innovation. I'm not saying somebody can't get rich off of exploitation. I'm not saying somebody can't get rich off of colonialization. Somebody can, some small group of people, but it will not enrich the whole economy. It will not, because how do you get richer? By innovating, by doing something more efficiently, higher quality, cheaper, better. That's how. You gotta make a better widget. That's the only way to grow the economy. And so I, I sometimes compare this, it's not a perfect metaphor, but I sometimes compare it to piracy. You know, a pirate can get very rich, but he doesn't enrich others, right? He just takes other people's stuff and transfers it to himself, okay? Exploitation is like piracy. That's all you'll get. You'll move money around, but you will not grow a whole economy. You will not make the pie bigger the way that Frederick Douglass talked about, where we can have win-wins and make each other richer. And so in the second chapter, we really took issue with these new historians of capitalism who want to keep on hitting this idea that capitalism and slavery go together. And we can complain even about the word capitalism uh, because are we talking about free markets, which is what we want to defend, or are we talking about cronyism, which we do not want to defend? Right? Sometimes capitalism, in people's minds, is associated with what does often happen, and that is people using their relationships with the state to privilege their own business over and against innovative startups, right? or poor entrepreneurs, people trying to break in and get started. And there's lots of things, subsidies and tariffs and overregulation and things you can do in order to do that and privilege yourself as an established business. That's not what we're talking about. That's not a free market. That's cronyism, because the state is picking winners and losers, not the consumer, right? Not the consumer. So that's the distinction there. As we go on to chapter three, you have some incredible work done on the post-emancipation period. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I highly recommend the book by Robert Higgs called Competition and Coercion. He's very good, and he goes back and looks at the way that black Americans used the one freedom they genuinely had. Of course, technically they were emancipated, but you don't have courts that will really defend their property rights, uh, right? You have a terrible cultural situation. Uh, of course, after Reconstruction, you have the reassertion of white supremacy. And so there's a constant struggle for black Americans, but they had one genuine freedom and it was the freedom to move. The freedom to move is very powerful. It's not as good as having all the freedoms, but it's something. And so what many of uh, the um, freedmen would do is they would bid their uh, farmers against each other, right? Now what they really wanted was their own farms, but that was really not possible, and I go into the details for why that was, which was terrible, because it was definitely what black Americans wanted. They wanted their own farms but they couldn't get their own farms and so they had to do sharecropping. So what they would do, which they actually preferred by the way to wages, and I just wanna say why. If you were sharecropping, you actually sort of ran your own day. You had a particular area of land, you were in charge of it, you gave the percentage to the owner and you kept the rest. It felt more like owning. Wage labor, they were worried that they'd be back under the whip, right, of the overseer. And so they actually did prefer sharecropping. And what they did is they started bidding the farmers against each other. So they'd say, well, over at Mr. Johnson's farm, I can get 20%, right? Well, over at this other farm, I can get 30%. And in some cases, we're able to push their share all the way up to 50%. Now, obviously, we're starting from a very low point in terms of wealth, but black America tripled its own internal economy in that period prior to 1910. It went at a much faster rate than the white economy did. Okay, once again, starting from a very low point, but still had some amount of catching up, and I think it was because of that freedom to move. But the really impressive thing about the post-emancipation period is actually the civil society, the building of civil society. And so we go into, in chapter five, for instance, what's called the womb of black America, the black church. This is a very important part of the story. 
because you have an institution in which black people are really the ones in charge and are not subject to someone else. And what that means is that church happens at church and everything else happens at church too, <laughs> right? The literacy classes happen at church. Crafting happens at church. Art happens at church. Business happens at church. Political organizing happens at church. It becomes a haven for the development of black culture. One of the most incredible accomplishments of black America in this period and maybe in the history of the world is the leap forward in literacy from almost zero at the end of the Civil War to 80% in 1930. That is outstanding. Higgs thinks he's not even sure there's another comparable case of literacy spreading that fast, at least not, not up to that point in history. And why? Because people stayed after church every Sunday to learn how to read. They were absolutely determined. And all hail Booker T. Washington and the National Negro Business League. And I'll tell you why. When we argue for this stringently in chapter six, I know that he's called an accommodationist, okay? I know that Du Bois said some things about him. They were like frenemies. Um, and Du Bois is a brilliant guy, but here's the thing. Du Bois wasn't in the Deep South. Booker T. Washington was. He was running Tuskegee. He came from Hampton and he started and he ran Tuskegee. Hampton Institute had a huge emphasis on private property. To this day, Virginia has a very high rate of black property ownership. Okay, it's an incredible legacy. He takes these same values of ownership to Tuskegee, but assassins have been sent to kill him. I mean, this is a very touchy situation. All right? And remember, guys, there was a reason that black property ownership was made illegal all the way back in the 1700s. I go through many, many cases of laws passed saying black people cannot own property. And explicitly in the legislature, they come right out and say, it builds too much self-esteem. They just come right out and say it, right? We don't want these people to have this much self-esteem. That's going to make it too hard to keep our oppressive system going so we can't have them own property. So you can understand why people would be after Booker T. Washington. Because this is an incredibly dignifying project. Not only do you own yourself, but you can own something that gives you a space within which you create what you want. Right? It's incredibly dignifying. It's honoring the human person. And so he's building this. And <laughs> You know, the Atlanta Convention speech, which is the famous, they call it the Atlanta Compromise. He talks about putting down your bucket where you are, and he says, you know, we can mix economically without mixing socially, and things like that. And one of his friends said to him, his, a white friend, said to him, well, you've talked to white audiences in the South, you've talked to white audiences in the North, you've talked to black audiences in the South, you've talked to black audiences in the North, but you have never talked to all four of those groups at the same time. He's like, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's telling him, this is going to be really hard to pull off. But he did. Washington pulled it off. I call that practical reason. I understand that we wouldn't say the things he said in that speech now. But I call that what Aristotle would call practical wisdom. <laughs> because he had to take into account the situation he was in. They would have burned Tuskegee to the ground. And let me tell you guys something, you don't want to lose Tuskegee Institute. Because out of the work of Booker T. Washington and the National Negro Business League, he created an incredibly powerful middle and upper income black community that became the base of the civil rights movement. He knew, he knew that it was the long game. You had to play the long game. You had to come up with enough economic clout to then be the lawyers. Right to fund the cases, to do that kind of work. If you were going to get the political rights, you needed the clout to do it. And he turned out to be totally right about that. Who gave one of the greatest founding gifts to the NAACP? Madam C.J. Walker, the first female millionaire in the United States of America, right? who made all her money off of, uh, off of black hair care products. Who published the picture of Emmett Till so that the whole country could be shocked by the cruelty of the South? 
John H. Johnson, who started Jet and Ebony magazine. Who held some of the first civil rights meetings, protected by a lot of guys with guns, by the way? T.R.M. Howard, the black hospitaler, the black doctor and, and, and hospitaler. OK, and he really liked his gun collection, too. Who, who protected Emmett Till's family while the trial was going on? T.R.M. Howard with all his guns at his beautiful estate. <laughs> that, that famous black doctor, OK? Because you need that. You need that economic clout. And Washington saw it. And so I think there's a little bit of a false dichotomy with Du Bois as well, where you sort of set up either you're interested in economic growth or you're interested in political rights. And Washington is saying, no, we need the economic growth to get the political rights. We also know that Washington was secretly funding a lot of political projects, uh, cases, boycotts. But he couldn't tell anybody that. He couldn't say that out loud. In the Deep South, he had to do it in secret. Once again, practical wisdom, right? So we really defend Booker T. Washington. I want to sort of rehabilitate the guy. He was so important. And we call that the long story of civil rights. Because it can't just be about this one period of time. And, and my, my, my uh, co-writer gets very frustrated <laughs> with his students because, of course, they're like, well, there was slavery and emancipation and then water fountains and Martin Luther King. You know, I mean, they have a very vague, vague uh, grasp on things sometimes. Right? And he says, no, there's actually this really interesting long story that builds for decades and decades and decades. And so we want to emphasize uh, the absolute, just incredible strength of black civil society. I haven't even mentioned fraternal organizations. Did you guys know that in the early 20th century, something like 30 to 50% of all black American males were in a fraternal organization? These were almost like social insurance. Uh, except they didn't check your risk level. They just let you be a member, you know? And if something went wrong, they'd, you know, if you died, they'd help your widow. They'd help with the funeral. If you were sick, they'd help you get through it so you could get back to work. People helped each other. But, but that also creates these ripple effects, right? You get, you know, you have the central purpose of the institution maybe to provide social insurance, but now you're getting to know each other. You're doing business together. You're giving each other no interest loans because you trust the guy, right? There's all sorts of organic things that come out of those sorts of institutions. That's why it's so terrible when we lose them. It's so terrible when they become weaker, when the church becomes weaker, when the fraternal institutions become weaker, because what we're losing is the whole collection of organic things that comes out of that. And so the story sort of turns as we get into the later parts of the book because things are getting better. We spend chapter four talking about atrocities. We talk about convict leasing. We talk about lynching. We talk about Ida Wells. We talk about all of that. But we're also telling the story of the church. We're telling the story of the entrepreneurship. And by 1948, when you see you know, sort of the economy begin to boom, Black American economy is also booming. So you've got, uh, you know, the numbers are different depending on who you read, but 87% or so poverty rate, 87% in the black community in 1948. By 1966, it's in the 40s. It's been cut in half. And that's before, most of that is happening before the civil rights legislation. It's happening because you've built up the education, the neighborhoods, the main streets, Right? The, the, the elk house, right? The, the dentist's office, the doctor's office, the schools. You've got all of this going. And so when the economy hit and you started to boom, black Americans were able to ride that wave. And it looked very hopeful. Working class, but upwardly mobile. Right? It looked very hopeful. And then things go terribly wrong. Now, of course, the efforts of the Federal Housing Administration with redlining had already been going on for decades. It didn't totally stop black people from getting houses, but it stopped a lot of it. Um, it, it had a significant effect. And the idea was um, actually derived from eugenics. I, I don't know how much we talk about this these days. Maybe we're talking about it more now. But we need to say out loud that eugenics was incredibly popular at the turn of the century in the United States. 
incredibly popular. I'm talking presidents, college presidents, famous economists, famous sociologists on the boards of eugenics organizations. Saying things like, I'm talking about like John Maynard Keynes, you know? Saying things like, this is the zenith of modern science. Now that we've fixed the quantity problem, we can move on to the quality problem. That was in a letter he wrote to Margaret Sanger, talking about people, talking about people. Economists put into famous textbooks that went out to freshmen in college all over the country, saying, since we can't chloroform the people we want to get rid of right now, Maybe we can just disemploy them. And how did they disemploy them? Actually, they suggested that we raise the wage. We create a very high minimum wage that will support the white Aryan head of household. And no one will pay that wage to the immigrant who can't speak English, or to a black person, or to a disabled person. OK? So we can disemploy this group and hopefully get rid of them. I, I'm not kidding. I mean, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but you can see the quotes in my book. They didn't, they didn't dance around it. They came right out and said it. It's incredible. And so, of course, World War II changes our attitude about eugenics. So it becomes a little less popular after that. But the fact of the matter is that when the Federal Housing Administration came in and decided that they knew best how neighborhoods should go, it was very much a product of this mindset. We're going to subsidize vanilla suburbs, and we will not insure the mortgages of integrated or black neighborhoods. We will not do it. And I give read the book The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Very good book. And he goes through it. Many of his examples are from St. Louis. I knew some of the families he mentioned in the book. I knew them personally, the grandchildren of some of the people who tried to build Good integrated neighborhoods. They were told, no, OK, what if I have a good white neighborhood and a good black neighborhood? And they're just next to each other. No. They can lease. They can't own. Well, what does that do to building wealth? It's not good. So you've already got redlining going. But here's the thing. I call this the one, two, three, four, five, six punch. You know, it's like <laughs> there's just a cascade of bad ideas. A cascade. And I, I connect these bad ideas to capital P progressivism. So I'm not, uh, there's connections to the way we use the word progressive now, but I'm talking about like Woodrow Wilson. I'm talking about the progressive movement. Capital P progressivism, pr progressivism is the attitude that because modern life is pretty complicated, we need to put experts in charge. We need to put experts in charge. We need to have a lot of administrative agencies figuring out what to do. OK? I think Woodrow Wilson was sort of frustrated with the separation of powers in the Constitution, actually. <laughs> he wished he could just ram things through, you know? Um, Woodrow Wilson, incredibly racist. We know this, right? Resegregates the federal government. After it had been integrated, he resegregated it. He showed the KKK film in the White House, OK? It's all eugenics, guys. It was popular. It was considered high science. I mean, I'm just telling you. We have to be honest about this stuff. Well, finally, it starts showing up in all of these, in all of these policies, OK? And so what do you get? You get this idea of urban renewal. James Baldwin calls this Negro removal. Because what are we going to do? We're going to take high-density housing. We think of them as slums. But I just told you, the poverty level was cut in half. OK? These were upwardly mobile working class people. We're going to wipe out your neighborhood and replace it with much fewer number of, of uh, dwellings. And of course, the price is going to be too high. Right? Because lower amount, lower supply, higher price. So you'll probably get moved to the second ghetto. Right, you've already been ghettoized by FHA, and I mean ghettoized in the, in the actual dictionary use of the word. Okay, so you've already been ghettoized by the FHA. Now we're going to shove you out to the second ghetto. Well, wait a second. My, and, and, and this is true with the federal highway system, too. Millions.
billions of dollars. Do you know that the federal highway system was the largest amount of money the federal government had ever spent outside of war? Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. They made little kings out of every municipal leader because now he's got hundreds of thousands of dollars to hand out. He can be friends with all the unions and all the concrete guys and all the asphalt guys and all, right? You become a little king for your political machine and you get to decide where the highway goes. Where are you gonna put it? Guys, it's in the municipal notes. They're gonna put it in the N-word town. They're gonna put it right through. That way there can be a big wall of separation between us and them, and we can get rid of parts of town we don't like. Now, admittedly, they were also the parts of town that wouldn't have um, affected the tax system as much, but there were also cases like in Miami where they could have gone through an industrial part of town. It would have been just as good, and they still chose to go through that part of town. All right, so it was partially economics and partially some other things. Okay, but boy, with those resources from the federal government to do this massive project, this changes the map of the United States. Wait a second, that little working class area was where my church was. That's where my school was. That's where my mom's shop is, right? That's where the, that's where the uh, Black Elks are, have their lodge house. What am I supposed to do, reconstitute all of that in some new part of town? We're all scattered now. So you have to remember, guys, it's not just about the direct effects, I knocked down your neighborhood. It's also about the indirect effects because so many decades had been poured into building this thick civil society. And we know it was effective because Black Americans in the 1950s had higher employment wage than, uh, rates than white Americans. They had similar marriage rates. They had similar uh, out of wedlock birth rates. All of these things are the same in the 1950s. And, and all of a sudden, and then you've got you know, the rise of the minimum wage in the 50s, and what happens to black teenage employment? Begins to go down. All right, you think, well, if I have to choose between who I'm gonna hire at this rate, this higher rate, I'm not gonna choose the person who you know, the other employees don't like or who doesn't have a car or whatever it might be. That's what happens, disemployment. Okay, so you have all of these sort of cascade effects. And of course, um, conservatives talk a lot about the perverse incentives of the welfare state. And what we try to do in the book is say, how we agree with that and how we want to nuance that, okay? So we absolutely agree with it because there, there is something called the benefits cliff. As a matter of fact, let me point you all, you can jot it down. Go to benefitscliffs.org, benefitscliffs.org. Employers can actually go there to see if I give my employee a raise, will it actually make them poorer because they'll lose their benefits. And so there's no rational reason for them to want to get promoted because it'll literally make, make their life worse. They'll have more responsibility and less money. Now that's a messed up incentive system. That's not, that's why we call it perverse, right? It's not incentivizing people in the way we want to. We want people to move up. We want them to do better. We want them to make more. But if we set up our benefit system in such a way that you're punished for doing better, then people will often quit, right? They won't keep going. It's actually economically irrational, to be fair, for them to do that. And in some cases, the, the gap, uh, my friend Craig Richardson at the Center for the Study of Socioeconomic Mobility in Winston-Salem, he says, it's not a benefits cliffs, it's a benefits desert. There is such a huge difference between what I can do working and what I can do without it, that it would be crazy not to. And instead of setting up a system where people can wean off slowly, we have a sudden drop. Okay, that's pretty perverse. It's pretty awful. And so will that undermine people's employment? Will it undermine their wealth accumulation? Will it undermine their family structure? Yes, it will. So we agree with the conservatives on that. But what we want to say to the conservatives is, that's just one thing that's happening, right? Just add that to the list 
along with the highways and the urban renewal. And hey, there's one I didn't even mention, the unions. The unions, look, a union's job is to get higher wages for its employees, right? One way to make a price of something go up is to shrink the supply. Keep it rare, right, like diamonds. <laughs> Keep them rare, and then you'll have a higher price. So a union is, by its very nature, looking for any excuse to say, this is the small pool of people that you have to choose from, and you have to pay them a high rate. Well, racism is a pretty good excuse. So we have a long history in America of unions being all white and saying we want to keep our jobs white. As a matter of fact, there was something called the Davis-Bacon Act, which required the federal government to only use union labor on its projects. And in the proceedings in the legislature, they come right out and say, we need to make sure these jobs go to the children of the colonists. You know, white people. OK? And so and James Baldwin in 1962 is on a talk show saying, you won't let us into your unions. This is why Booker T. Washington said, put down your bucket where you are. Because if you went north, and he was very explicit about this. He said, we could all move to the north now. This is before the, the, the great migrations. He says, we could all move to the north now. But if we do, we'll enter the industries, they'll unionize, and then they will, and I quote, push the black man to the wall. So don't even go north. Just stay in the south. And we'll focus on trades and property ownership and that sort of thing and education down here. And even Du Bois, as, I mean, he eventually became a full-blown communist, but he was always very push and pull with the unions. He really didn't like them, and neither did Douglas. And that, and that was part of the reason why. So what, I, what I'm trying to say to conservatives is, I know you guys love the Constitution. So you've got to love property rights, and you've got to love contract rights, and you've got to love free trade. At least I hope so. <laughs> And so you can actually look at the history of black America, and you can speak with intelligence and grace on what black Americans have endured, appealing to your very own values, these individual rights. You don't have to buy into an economic theory you can't accept, or an oppressor and oppressed lens through which we analyze everything. No, that's not true. Uh, uh, there are cases of oppression, and there's lots of other ways to think about history, too. We're not saying that oppression is the one thing to think about. I mean, that's the point of the chapter on the black church and the chapter on entrepreneurship, right? We're celebrating the fact that people can accomplish great things even in terrible circumstances. There's a lot going on in history. There's not one cause. Don't be monocausal. <laughs> Don't be monomaniacal, right? And so we're saying to conservatives, you can talk about these things. You can talk about this history well. And you can explain it well. And when you bring up things like the perverse incentives of the welfare state, just remember to include the other things too. right? Just talk about all of those things that hit all at the same time in just a few decades. I mean, really an incredibly short amount of time. And so the terrible drops uh, in family structure and things like that that we've seen, it hits the black community first because they're the most vulnerable. But now it's hit everybody. We can see it. Daniel Patrick Moynihan was panicking in the early 60s about the out of wedlock birth rate in the black community, the white community today has already surpassed that by five percentage points. We're at 30%, right? And he was in an absolute panic for 25%, okay? And Latinos are at 50%. It's just a problem. It's just a pro it's an American problem. It just hit the African American community first. And you can say the same thing about issues of criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, et cetera. These are issues that you will hear more from the black community on because they are being disparately affected, but they're American problems. They're problems that we all share. And we can discuss them from the perspective of individual rights and appropriate state power. And we can have a lot more conversations that way than we have with these false dichotomies and heavy, heavily ideological approaches. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for 
through the book to start those conversations. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'll just point out uh, as a matter of uh, advertising for another lecture that was uh, part of the perspective series that uh, during the COVID season, um, Craig Richardson was a speaker on um, a perspectives uh, lecture for us here uh, that you can find on the, the Center for the Study of Economic Liberties website about this uh, benefits cliff problem. Yes. Um, that he, he developed a way of approaching and, and analyzing. So uh, that, that's just making sure you know that the center has done some, something, has something connected to this. Um, and can I just mention too, I, so I have an article called Innovating Our Way Up mm -hmm. in Profectus where it's basically an overview of Craig Richardson's oh, work. Cool. And I do all the links and everything in there. He's so fantastic. Check yeah. out Innovating he Our Way Up because you can just click the links. Um, so I, I, I open the floor for some questions. I'll bring you the microphone. Um, we don't have another mic, right? This one. Oh, okay. I'll just I'll just take the mic with me. And uh, so, are there any questions? Yes. I'm going to go back there because they got their hands up first, <laughs> and you're closer to the front. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned things like uh, Jim Crow laws and stuff like that, because they they certainly were um uh, basically enforced by rule of law. So, like, yes. the free market would have um, if it been allowed to um work, someone could have integrated on their own, but the laws prevented that, right? Um, yeah. How and why do you think um a lot of this has been sort of uh flipped now? Um. Like this idea of that the, the government needs to get more involved in order to, for social justice to be uh, to be. Uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. So I just want to sort of reiterate what you said about Jim Crow. Um, Jim Crow was a cascade of municipal, state, and federal legislation. It wasn't just people wanting to be separate. It was it was constantly forcing people to be separate. As a matter of fact, you know, you had streetcar companies and companies like that arguing, this is really expensive. I'm not saying they were great racial reconciliation people or something like that, but they knew that to have a separate car for black people is way more expensive, and also you're kind of taking off half your customer base. And so they actually sued, but they lost, right? And so I want to um, acknowledge the point that Jim Crow is the imposition of the rule of law, but not of just laws because just laws have to be equally applied. And this goes all the way back to Thomas Aquinas and natural law, right? He says one of the main, if you guys aren't aware, in the letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King Jr., he refers specifically to natural law theory in Thomas Aquinas in his defense of civil disobedience. He's absolutely clearly referring to Thomas Aquinas. And he's giving his defense of civil disobedience from there. And the idea of natural law is that, you know, it has to be from proper authority and, you know, there's different, it has to be promulgated, you have to be able to know it, you know, there's different things that make a law just. But one of the things that makes a law just is that it's generally applied. It's applied to people generally and the only thing that can be different in the way that it's applied is if you're maybe a child or something like that, right? Someone who doesn't have a full will. Okay. And so since that's not true, uh, that's not a difference between black and white people, it was totally unjust. So it's true that market forces could have enticed people to mix even against their, their racist inclinations. But I always want to give this caveat. It, Gary Becker made this point. You have to pay for your, for your prejudice. You do. You have to pay for your prejudice. If you want to be prejudiced against some group, then you've got a smaller group of people to choose from to employ or sell to or whatever. So you will pay for your prejudice. But let me tell you, some people will. And Higgs makes this point in competition and coercion. He goes, don't think that Becker's point that you have to pay for your prejudice means that markets will always solve it. They won't. People are evil. Sorry, I'm a Christian. I believe in original sin. OK? <laughs> Deep, I mean, people are twisted. We do terrible things. We do terrible things, and we get it really twisted. And so I want to say it's not like some magical solution that would solve all racism, but 
would there have been more organic mixing? Yes, and one reason we know is because we actually went backwards. And so in California and various places, you actually had integrated neighborhoods that were then segregated. Remember, if you had a factory, you'd have sort of like the Polish street, and then the Irish street, and then the black street, and then the Italian street. And you can tell by the churches, right? Here's the, the, the Irish Catholic Church and the Polish Catholic Church and the black church. You know, you can see they were on the different blocks. People lived really close to each other. So if you're going to ship people out to the suburbs and then you're going to trap other people here, right, you have actually done that in a top-down central planning kind of manner. And so, so right, so yeah, it's, it's nuanced, but I think, I think that's a really good point. And so the question is, man, if we were doing this with this cascade of laws, why do we think another cascade of laws will solve it? Okay, let me spend a minute on that question. Um, so much of what I do in my life is try to explain to people the concept of spontaneous order. Spontaneous order is a term that comes from the Nobel Prize winning economist F.A. Hayek. And some people say emergent order, but it's the same idea. And the idea is very counterintuitive. That's what makes it hard. It's counterintuitive, and here's why. I'm in charge of my household. I'm the central planner of my household. If I start a business, I'm the central planner of my business. If I run my class, I'm the central planner of my class, right? If I'm the president of a university, I'm the central planner. Of the, you know, you can go on, right? And so central planning seems like the way to do things. And we're being rational, we're making plans, we're deciding who does what, we're deciding who gets what. It's a very natural way to approach things. But the thing is, when a society gets to a certain size, you can't centrally plan it. You don't have the knowledge, right? The central planner has no idea who should make what, produce what, where it should go, how much of it should be, should you have gluten-free bread or not, you know what I mean? The central planner doesn't know. That's why the USSR was such a massive failure economically and you had such terrible outcomes because central planners don't have the knowledge. So how do we do it in a spontaneous order? And the thing that's the key to understanding this is seeing prices like little, how do you want to put it? They're like, they're like little packets of information that are just dashed out all over this complex system and everybody's able to respond to the prices. So the price of something goes up, I back off, I use something else, right? I didn't know I was preserving a rare good, I just didn't wanna pay the money, right? But the point is, is it forces us to allocate our resources efficiently. So you get these really complex economies, but no one is centrally planning them. Okay, so now let's go back to the progressive mindset. If the progressive mindset is, Modern life is complicated, therefore we need experts to be in charge, then it's a mindset that doesn't grasp the concept of spontaneous order. So if you say, well, the government caused the problem, so the government has to solve the problem. Guess what, my friends? The government can cause problems that the government can't solve. Because think about what I just told you. Decades and decades and decades of investment into civil society, dashed, destroyed from the top. How do you rebuild that? You could make a very similar argument about, you know, the USSR after the, after the fall of communism. How do you take away everybody's culture for 75 years and then expect them to somehow have a culture? Right? You took, you, you systematically took it away. And so are those people going to have to rebuild in a very complicated, organic way that's got to come up from below and be a decentralized effort? Yes, they have to. You can't actually make that happen centrally, but that is a very hard thing for people to grasp. And so they just think, you solve it, you cause the problem, you solve the problem. Problem was caused by central planning, problem will be solved by central planning. It's just that it won't. Does that, does that help? Yeah. yeah. I know it's kind of big ideas, but it's like counterintuitive, right? We have to sort of wrap our brains around these ideas. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, insightful comments. Thank uh, you. I'm wondering if in your research you ran across any real discussion of, uh, of looking at the pros and cons of looking at, at uh, the term qual uh, equality, say Martin Luther King view, mm. versus uh, equity. 
We didn't get into that in the book, but I am aware of the debate. Um, I'll just say this about it in case it's helpful. So of course, one way to say it is to say that equality has to do with um, opportunity and equity has more to do with outcomes. We want to get people to the same place. That is not in and of itself a terrible idea. So if you go all the way back to Aristotle, he actually talks about the equity of a judge, a judge who uses equity. Well, what does that mean? That means that the judge takes the specific circumstances into account. And judges do this, right? There's a certain spectrum within which they have to judge. It, you're guilty or you're not, right? Or you're going to be punished or you're not. But they might say, you know, this person should really go to drug court, right? Or this person should really be on parole, but, you know, this person should go to a work program. This, okay, they have some outside support. This person needs to get off the street, you know? And so they're using their judgment to kind of handle the particular circumstances of the person. What that means is that equity can make sense if I'm face to face with you. Right? So if I'm a teacher in a classroom, yes, I notice that student is gifted. I need to make sure they get higher grade level books. This student is behind. I need to make sure they get better attention from the reading helper. Right? That works great. No problem when it's face to face. The problem is when you try to do central planning. That's where it goes wrong. So the impulse is right. But it doesn't mean that you can codify it into law. Because what is the nature of law? It's general. It's universally applied. Law can't take your particular circumstances into account. The law doesn't see your face. Justice is blind, right? Justice doesn't know your particular circumstances. And so you can't codify equity into law. It's an impulse that we have in personal relations that is very good. It's saying this person needs a little more, this person needs a little less, right? How can I help everybody to thrive? But I will say this last thing, which is I'm not too excited about the idea of equality of outcome at all. And um, I'll say just a couple things. One, in a market economy, I'm going to shock you all. You ready for this? Politically incorrect. In a market economy, you need inequality. You need it. Why? Because in market economies, we invest in long-term production processes. And you don't make money on a Thursday when you started your business on a Tuesday. <laughs> when it's a long-term production process, you got to build the factory. You got to get the machines. You got to hire the workers. You got to make a plan. You got to get investors. It can take years before you ever see a penny. What does that mean? It, me it means that you need to hoard up capital. Now, will that company make people richer? Yes, because long-term production processes are way more efficient. And so people will get cheaper clothes and iPhones and whatever it is, right? It'll make people's lives better. But it'll take a few years before you can get there. You need investors. You need people who are going to do that. And those people aren't just people who have more capital. They're also people who are willing to take on more risk. Entrepreneur means undertaker in French, I think. If anybody speaks French, that's what I've been told. I don't speak French. But I've been told it means undertaker. And so what are you undertaking? Risk. And let me tell you, there is nothing wrong with wanting to be an employee, get your paycheck every two weeks, have a nice little mortgage in a car, and not have to worry about life. Not everybody has the gift of the entrepreneur. Not everybody wants to have their rear end on the line. That's stressful, <laughs> right? And so you're going to have some people who want to do that, some people who don't want to do that, some people who are good at that, some people who aren't good at that. So we don't want too much inequality. But we need some inequality. And the interesting thing about market economies is that what you will see, and this is very good because it has a stabilizing effect. Even Aristotle said this. You want to have a big, fat middle class. Because middle class people are stabilizing. They have a stabilizing effect. They've got, man, they're putting money away to send their kids to college. They can't get involved in a revolution right now. <laughs> you know, They don't have time for that. 
So it's very, very good. And market economies create huge middle classes. And what you see, and you saw it in the South and North. In the South, in the south you had the very rich aristocratic planters and everybody else was poor. There was very little in between. Right, and you went north and you had a burgeoning middle class. Frederick Douglass met poor whites in the north and he says, you call that poor? I'll show you poor, you can come south with me. He was shocked. He was like, they're doing pretty good compared to what I've seen, okay? And so uh, I, I sort of object <laughs> to the idea that we want equality of outcome, but I think finally my major objection is that it requires tyranny. I mean, to, to, to maintain perfect equality between people requires tyranny because people have different gifts and you know some some people will make bad choices some people make good choices there'll be luck you know different things and it requires tyranny and we've seen that we saw that in the 20th century and it was terrible it was a bloody 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 century a hundred million civilians killed by their own governments to create a quality of outcome a lot of my students don't even know that they think hitler killed the most people no stalin mao of millions of people killed by their own governments to create equality of outcome. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge killed one third of the Cambodian population in four years. Can you even believe that? They killed people with glasses because they looked like they might be in college. Because that would make you unequal. It would make you better. So let's not get too excited about the idea of equality of outcome. Here's what I want. I want everybody to get richer. You know, that's all I care about. I care about human flourishing. So if you are poor in such a way that you cannot flourish, I want you to have more, more money. <laughs> I want you to have what you need so that you can flourish. That's what matters to me. Not that you're Mark Zuckerberg. I'm, I'm mad about the gap between you and Mark Zuckerberg. Who cares? That doesn't affect me, right? What affects me is when I have a poor neighbor who's struggling and can't actually actualize their capacities. That's what human life is for, is to develop your capacities. I want my neighbors to all be able to do that. That's what matters. What matters is busting out of poverty, not creating perfect equality, because perfect equality will only be achieved when everybody's poor together. That's how you get perfect equality of outcome. I want to try, challenge you a little bit on, on your thesis, because while it's true that black Americans have been denied economic liberty a great deal over over history and that that and that combined with the other forces you you talked about have imposed a lot of historical uh, uh, handicaps on them in, in where I'm originally from California the rel the closest equivalent was the treatment of Asians so mm. in in mm -hmm. California until 1952 Asians were not even allowed to own land uh, the Japanese were literally sent to prison camps. Yeah, internment camps. And yet today, here's, here's, this is a, re, a rather, relatively recent report on uh, median wealth in Los Angeles in California. The median net worth of white households in Los Angeles today is $355,000. In comparison, Mexicans and U.S. blacks have a median wealth of 3500 and 4000 respectively. Whereas the Japanese median in household wealth is five hundred and ninety-two thousand yeah. dollars, which is twice the yeah. median net worth of a white household in California. They're by far the richest demographic yeah. in California, even though, like I said, within within the lifetimes of a lot of people, they were not allowed to own land. Yeah. So, what accounts for that difference? Do you think that it's because they were let you know left out of the benevolence of the great society? Or do you think that it's, uh, there's a difference in, in social family mores? Or what do you think accounts for, the, for this radical yep. difference in outcomes today? Yeah, yeah, really great question. Um, Thomas Sowell talks about this a lot. I just reviewed social justice fallacies for law and liberty. So you can see me you know, agreeing with him on this point. Um, and so the first thing I always say is I quote Glenn Lowry, um, social science is harder than physics. Right, social science is harder than physics, right? We're talking about causality with a lot of factors. And it's not like in the hard sciences where you can isolate a variable totally. We're dealing with human beings, right? The variables, you can't isolate them. And so you got a lot of variables going. And so we can, we can think about it, right? We can't necessarily prove uh, the story we're gonna tell. But what I would say is, what I uh, talk about is the, the difference between 
proximate causes and non-proximate causes. So you have you know, racist laws and, and um, you know, oppressive systems, you know, as, as I mentioned, right? The one, two, three, four, five punch, right? However you want to think about it. Um, inspired sometimes by racism, sometimes by well and good intentions, um, but just terrible policies. And so that can be a, a non-proximate cause, but go back to what I talked about, about the destruction of civil society. So maybe you were motivated by racism, but what you did was destroy the institutions that, uh, up, that build and uphold culture. And so what you end up with is a cultural problem. But first, let me make something very clear. 80% of black Americans are not poor. A majority of black Americans are, are middle class. Okay, and so when we think of our most destabilized neighborhoods, let's just remember that this is a minority group, right? This does not represent black America. It's a certain subsection of black America, but it is a subsection in which the culture was really undermined. And so, do we have cultural issues like, like fatherhood absence and things like that? Yes. And that has a devastating effect on the ability to build wealth. Um, I think, frankly, today, a huge proportion of this is family structure. And guys, right? But what I'm saying is that that's the proximate cause. It doesn't mean you can't go back and tell a more complicated story about non-proximate causes, including racism and progressivism, et cetera. But now, the proximate cause of poverty is family structure. And guys, I can show you in the literature where literally every single demographic is getting richer, and yet the poverty rate is going up only because single motherhood is going up so much. And of course, the correlation with single motherhood is high with poverty and criminality. Of course it is, because how in the world do you have the better outcomes with just one when you should have two, right? I mean, that's obvious. It's going to be so much harder to, to support the children. It's going to be so much harder to be there for the children. Everything is going to be harder. And then if you've lost your church and you've lost your school and you've lost your solidarity, if a lot of those things have been lost and the people who were actually quite successful are now somewhere else, right, because they got out but you didn't, then you're really in a totally destabilized situation. So one thing I didn't get into in the talk, but I do in the book, is solutions. And obviously a lot of them are going to be economic policy and criminal justice reform and educational freedom and things like that. But one of the solutions I've actually talked about most since I've gone on the tour is uh, neighborhood stabilization. And so neighborhood stabilization is a response to the way that our private philanthropy can actually imitate the perversion of public charity in that we undermine people's dignity by undermining their work and their families. And we might be doing it privately you know, through our private charity. And so there's this whole movement now, you guys can look uh, look at When Helping Hurts by Brian Fickert or Toxic Charity by Bob Lupton or you know, the great John Perkins. Right? There's lots of people writing on this. Bob Woodson in Washington, D.C. And they're saying, we've got to totally rethink the way that we're doing charity because if we're going to help people, we need to empower them, not just treat them like passive recipients. We need to treat people like they have something to offer in the marketplace. So I, I jumped to solutions there. But I am assuming that the proximate cause are these cultural differences, but that there's a complicated story to talk about how we got there. And it's not just access to property, right? It's all of these other indignities. And so, and the way that they're stacked, you know, unions, highways, urban renewal, <laughs> welfare. I mean, you just stack them. And, and so it hits an already vulnerable community very hard. And it really breaks my heart when you look at that 1948 to 1966 number. And you think, were we about to break through? Do we have a community here that was about to break through and then we just crushed it? That's how it feels to me. Um, but social science is harder than physics. <laughs>
Do we have time for any more? Um, I, I'd like to thank the audience for their attendance and their participation in the discussion. I think this has been one of the most engaging audience to speaker events we've had for a while. So it's nice to be getting back into the rhythm of in-person events and, and not just uh, looking at each other on the Zoom boxes in a, in, on a screen that depersonalize us and separate us from each other. Uh, let's thank our, our speaker, Rachel, and um, uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everybody. Good discussion.